Okay, uh, so back in 1.6, one of the things that we sort of saw was the start of the uncertainty principle, which was sort of uh, this idea that the standard deviation of x and the standard deviation of p multiplied together always had to be greater than or equal to h bar over 2. So what this told you back in chapter 1 was that there's sort of this limit on the amount of information we can know, right? Uh, we can't know both position and momentum exactly. There's always going to be some probabil uh, probability based uncertainty in one or the other. And the more accurately we know one of these two values, the more the other one becomes uncertain. So this chapter or 3.5.1 is going to prove that because sort of back in chapter one, we sort of just were told this by Griffiths and we weren't actually given any proof of it and we're just told okay just assume that this is how the world actually works uh, now we can sort of see this in a direct consequence of sort of the math that comes out by using the tool of linear algebra to look at quantum mechanics so let's do this proof it's a very I should say sort of coming out of left field proof um, it's not something that I would expect anyone to be able to do on their own unless they were already sort of a professional scientist. Um, but that being said, we will just sort of take Griffith's step by steps, uh, just for granted and accept them as is. Uh, so we're going to start relatively simple. Uh, and we're going to recognize that the variance from way back in chapter one was defined in this way. So the variance of anything, we'll call it a, is sigma squared is equal to the expectation value of the operator subtracted by the expectation value of that operator and take this whole thing squared and we're expect we're taking the expectation value of that furthermore so note that all observables are hermitian and as a result of that any individual standard deviation or variance or anything like that of that observable is therefore by consequence also going to be Hermitian right because all observables are Hermitian so that means we can say that you know okay uh, in sort of the bracket notation this is the same thing as saying psi inner product with this same operator or sorry without the brackets on the outside uh, a hat minus the expectation value of a hat squared acting on psi. And if this is Hermitian, well, and let me just extend that. Okay, if this is Hermitian, I can just take one of these and move them to the left, right? So this is effectively the same thing as saying a hat minus expectation value of a hat acting on psi inner product with that same operator a hat minus expectation value of a hat acting on psi. We can condense this into shorthand if I say well let's define f as the function of a hat minus expectation value of a hat acting on psi in which case this is just equal to the inner product of f with itself. I can do the exact same thing with some other arbitrary operator, b. So let's say variance of b is equal to the expectation value of g, or sorry, the inner product of g with itself, where g is going to be defined as some new operator, b hat, minus expectation value b hat, operating on psi. So I've defined two arbitrary operators, right? and at this point, remember, my goal is to get something of this type. So I'm trying to multiply sigma a and sigma b, or sigma a squared and sigma b squared, and get a general formula. So what can I do? Well, if I just multiply this, what am I going to get? Uh, sigma a squared, whoops, sigma a squared multiplied by sigma b squared is going to equal, as of right now, nothing useful. The inner product of f with itself multiplied by the inner product of g with itself. We can't really do anything with this, 
well, actually we can, but just off the top of my, your head, right? It seems like we're kind of stuck because this doesn't really tell us anything. And the solution to this is gonna be the Schwartz inequality. So uh, a little while back, we were told by Griffiths that there is a property that's called the Schwartz inequality, which basically tells us that given two functions, f and g, the magnitude of the integral over some region from a to b of f star times g dx is always going to be less than or equal to the square root of the integral over that same region a to b of magnitude f squared dx multiplied by an integral over that same region a to b of the magnitude squared of g dx. And well, in this case, right, this is in bracket notation. If we extend, if we decide to expand bracket notation, well, the inner product of f with itself is just equal to the integral from negative infinity to infinity of f star times f. In which case, that's just equal to the integral from negative infinity to infinity of magnitude f squared. Same thing. If I expand the inner product of g with itself in bracket notation, that's just equal to the integral from negative infinity to infinity of magnitude g squared dx. So in that case, now I have something I can work with. Even better, right, before I even go further, even better, by using the Schwartz inequality, this is going to give me an inequality that I can relate it to, which is going to help me even more, because remember, my original goal is to get something that looks like this, right, a generalized uncertainty principle get something that's like sigma of something times sigma of something else is going to be greater than or equal to something. So this gives me an actual inequality that I can work with, which is even better. So let's write this out fully. Uh, in this case, I now have sigma a squared, sigma b squared is equal to magnitude f with itself times magnitude g with itself. And this is going to be greater than or equal to and here, well, this multiplied by itself is just the term inside here, right? So if I square both sides, then the square root here disappears. And what I get left is the magnitude squared of the integral from a to b of f star g dx. And if I wish to rewrite this in bracket notation, this is just the magnitude squared of the inner product of f with g. Okay. Now we're getting somewhere. Uh, let's just rewrite this real quick. Sigma a, actually, you know what? Instead of doing that, I'm just going to get rid of this and move this up like this. Okay, so the next step, um, I would say sort of comes out of nowhere, but uh, at this point, we sort of are stuck again because we have a general inequality, but it's not necessarily uh, that nice because it's very arbitrary, right? F and G can be whatever the hell we want it to be. Uh, maybe we want to make this a little bit easier because, you know, F and G are just arbitrary uh, functions based on operators. They can be pretty complicated, right? And that's not necessarily the best thing. Technically, this proof is already done, but there is a step that we can go further to make it a little bit neater. And what I mean by that is we can recognize the fact that, you know, F and G are generally complex, right? F, if we look up here, F and G are operators on the wave function. These do not necessarily have to be real, right? The wave function is a complex thing. The operator is some, you know, operator that acts on the complex thing, right? This, this doesn't necessarily have to be real because remember, it's the magnitude squared of terms like this that actually turn out to be real. So in that case, what we can say is, well, I can recognize that for any complex number, right? Let's just say z is equal to a plus bi, right? So if I take the magnitude squared of z, well, this is equal to a squared plus b squared, right? Or uh, this is specifically, it's equal to the real component squared plus the imaginary component squared. So this and I, I feel that this is sort of this next part comes out of nowhere, but Griffiths is going to say, okay, well, this is greater or equal to strictly the imaginary component squared. That's true, right? You might not be sure why he 
decided to pull this out arbitrarily, but this is true, and it's very obviously true, right? The real component can be zero, or it could be some non-zero value, whatever, no matter what it is, or no matter what the imaginary or the real components are, the whole sum is going to be greater than just the individual imaginary component, no matter what, or equal to it. And the imaginary component can be rewritten as one over two i multiplied by z minus z star squared. And if you want to, you know, fully prove this, right, this is going to give you 1 over 2i times real plus i imaginary minus real minus i star imaginary, which becomes plus i imaginary. The reals cancel out, you get 2i, which cancels out with the 2i at the bottom, you get imaginary squared. So this is true. And in that case, since this term is just generally an imaginary number z, we can rewrite this. And we can say, okay, instead, I'm going to write sigma a squared, sigma b squared is greater than or equal to the magnitude of the inner product of f with g squared. But this in turn is going to be greater than or equal to the imaginary component of this term, right? And that is going to be equal to just one over two i times f inner product g minus f inner product g star. And then I take this whole thing and square it. Next, recognize that, you know, via bracket notation, if I take the complex conjugate of a bracket integral, then I'm just going to, it's the same thing as just switching them around. So this is equal to f g minus g f like that. So now writing it out fully, sigma a squared, sigma b squared is going to be greater than or equal to 1 over 2i times inner product of f with g minus inner product of g with f. Take this whole thing and square it. Okay, we're almost there. So next part is we're gonna re-expand f and g back into the original two observables that we're working with, a hat and b hat, because remember the whole point is that we're trying to define the relation of the uncertainties between a and b, which are two arbitrary, you know, uh, operators which represent observables, whether they be position, momentum, energy, whatever we want, right? So if we expand the inner product of f and g and g and f, what you'll see is that we can actually cancel out a lot of the stuff. And I'm gonna write this in orange. Uh, the inner product of f with g turns out this is going to equal a hat minus expectation value of a, this whole thing acting on psi, inner product with b hat minus expectation value of b, I forgot to add my hats, or I suppose b hat or b, it doesn't necessarily matter, I'm getting my notation mixed up, uh, whatever, uh, multiplied by psi. And remember, you know, these terms are Hermitian, right? Because they are representing the standard deviation of an observable, therefore they are going to be Hermitian themselves because they are, themselves are also going to be observable. So in that case, there's nothing stopping us from moving the left term into the right, in which case this becomes an inner product of psi with a hat minus expectation value of a uh, times b hat minus expectation value of b multiplied by psi. Apologies, that's my phone going off. I should really mute it. Okay, anyway, um, take this inner product. And at this point, well, if we expand it, this is going to give me a hat b hat minus a hat expectation value of b minus expectation value of a b hat plus expectation value of a, expectation value of b. So if I rewrite this, this is going to give me 
four inner products, psi with a hat b hat, minus psi inner product a hat expectation b, minus psi expectation a b hat, plus psi expectation a expectation b like that okay next step once again uh, sort of take advantage of Hermitian right so this thing is gonna stay the same I'm not gonna deal with it well actually I'm gonna write this in shorthand in bracket again So this is going to give me the expectation value of a hat, b hat, minus, and at this point, well, here I can sort of once again use uh, the property of this whole thing sort of being Hermitian, right? Because this is going to give me technically the expectation value of a hat times the expectation value of b or expectation value of a hat times the expectation value of b hat with a bigger expectation value outside of it. And what, what does this actually mean, right? It's the expectation of the product of a hat and this expectation value b, but the expectation value is already a constant, right? The expect, if you, what, what is the expectation value technically? It's the average, right? So if you, calculate the expectation value it's already a constant there's no point in finding the average of an average it's just a constant now so it just comes out so this is actually exactly the same as just saying you know uh the expectation value of a hat times the expectation value of b hat or or a and b I, it doesn't I, I mess up my notations again because but it doesn't matter um, but yeah, that's the. This is the same thing because expectation value of b is a constant. It just comes out of the the bracket. Same thing here, right? The expectation val value of a is a constant. It comes out of the bracket. What you get is expectation value of a times expectation value of b again. Plus and over here, same thing. They just come out, assuming that your wave function is normalized and you know, real, physically realizable. You know, th this is just going to be a. B and then the inner product of psi with itself, but assuming that this is a well-behaved and normalized function, this just goes to one. So at this point, uh, you know, this is gonna give you the expectation value of a hat, b hat, and one of these terms is gonna cancel with one of these terms, whoops. So your minus a, be expectation like that. Similarly, if you do this exact same process, but with the opposite order, you know, the inner product of G with F, if you work this out, it's going to give you B hat, A hat, minus the expectation value of A times the expectation value of B. So in that case, going back to here, right? Well, this term is just going to turn into one over two i, and then let's do this in orange again. Expectation value of a hat b hat minus expectation a expectation b subtracted by b hat a hat expectation plus expectation a expectation b. this whole thing squared, in which case these two terms cancel out. So what you have is one over two I expectation value of a B minus expectation value B a this whole thing squared. And, you know, we saw something like this back in chapter two, when was it chapter two or chapter one, I can't quite remember. Um, I believe it's chapter two and my bracket is horrible. I'm sorry. Uh, we saw this back in chapter two, I believe, uh, when we were working with the simple harmonic oscillator, right? We recognize that this specific form, this is called a commutator. 
and this is the same thing it's just this can be written as a hat b hat like that or sorry the expectation value of a hat b hat because specifically a hat b hat commutator is equivalent to a hat b hat minus b hat a hat right so in this case because they're brackets over them, their expectation values, we just throw an expectation value over the front as well. And now we have our general expression that we can actually calculate because commutators tend to be typically a lot easier to sort of define and solve compared to all the way up here when we have sort of these abstract functions of f and g, which are defined as, you know, the sigma operator acting on the wave function, which is a lot more arbitrary and hard to work with. So writing this out fully, our generalized wave function is sigma a squared, sigma b squared is always greater than or equal to one over two i times the expectation value of the commutator of your two operators in question squared. And what is the significance of this? Uh, hopefully you already see it. It's that, you know, the position momentum Heisenberg uncertainty principle that we sort of talked about back in chapter one, that is just one very specific case of a much more generalized principle that we call the generalized uncertainty principle. So let's work an example with this, right? Uh, let's do x and p, right? So x hat is equal to x, p hat is equal to negative i h bar p by dx. And, you know, we already know from earlier on that the commutator of x with p is equal to i h bar from earlier problems. I forgot where, but we've, we, we've seen this multiple times. So that means that sigma a squared, sigma b, or I suppose sigma x squared times sigma p squared is going to be greater than or equal to one over two i times i h bar squared, which equals h bar half squared, which is just the standard, you know, momentum position uncertainty principle from back in chapter one. So, the, the point of this is to show that, you know, we can actually generalize any number of arbitrary uncertainty principles between any two uh, sort of operators, right? It can be position, momentum, it doesn't, but like, it doesn't just have to be those, you know, we can incorporate other observables, velocity, um, energy, all those other stuff. We can basically calculate the uncertainty of finding this always uh, of between any two arbitrary operators. At this point, the next step is sort of to question, okay, well, this term isn't always necessarily going to be non-zero, right? Sometimes you have operators that do commute, right? Like it's, we, we've been looking at sort of operators that don't commute where sort of this term, commutator A hat, B hat, doesn't equal zero. But what about terms where you have two operators that are assumed physical and therefore realize they uh, sort of observable, what happens when they do equal zero? Because if they do equal zero, that sort of this implies that you can in fact determine both values of those observables perfectly simultaneously. And there is a mathematical significance behind that. And we're gonna see that later down the line in problem 3.16, it turns out that when observables are sort of, uh, when, when observables have a commutator that doesn't equal zero, they're called incompatible observables. Whereas ones that do equal zero are called compatible observables. And it turns out that mathematically, uh, incompatible observables don't share a complete set of eigenfunctions. And we'll see that once again, we'll see this in chapter 3.16. Uh, right now it just sort of sounds like mathematical garbage, right? I'm just saying words at this point, but uh, we will see sort of a mathematical proof of that in 3.16, which should help a little bit more. But um, before we end this, let's sort of talk more in the physical realm, because we've been very abstract up to now. Um, you know, in a lab, when you're actually observing something, a quantum system, you know, what is stopping us from being able to measure both position and momentum? Right? What, why are we not allowed to know both of them simultaneously? And the reason why 
is sort of a direct consequence of the fact that we analyze everything in quantum mechanics in terms of the wave function. Because remember, the wave function is what ultimately determines anything in the system, right? It determines what the position is or the probability of the position being in some range, it determines momentum, it determines energy, blah, blah, blah. So the wave function is obviously, right, according to its name, it's a wave. Right, and you take the ma this is psi, and when you take the magnitude squared of psi, that gives you a probability distribution of position or momentum or whatever other space you're in. So let's consider this to be psi of x, in which case, you know, this is x and this is psi, in which case, you know, if you take the magnitude squared, then it becomes probability, blah, 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 we don't care. Um, but this is, a, you know, if you know sort of the position of a particle exactly versus if you don't know the position of a particle exactly this is an it, this is a example of a wave function where you don't know the particle's position exactly because this is a wave right the particle has some probability of being here it has some probability of being here blah 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 right it, it has a very ill-defined position it has a spread out probability distribution as a result of that, you know, you, you know for a fact that, oh, you know, the, the, you can't determine x with 100% certainty. You know, it has, it has, according to this wave function at least, a roughly equal chance of being in this region as it does in this region. However, in this case where x is not well defined, p is very well defined because remember, momentum is directly related to the wave function. Uh, I think that's lambda. Right, that's that's the mathematical definition for wave function. I'm I'm not sure. Uh, I I forgot off the top of my head, but just let's just assume that it is. Um, this is the wave function. Um, but p we know is directly related to the wave function. If your wave function is spread out like this, right, this is a very well defined wave function. You can measure it, right? What's the distance between this point and this point? This is the wavelength of your wave function, right? P is directly related to the wavelength. In which case p is very well defined in this scenario because right you you can find you can just look and measure the distance between these two peaks and that's a wavelength therefore you know p now in contrast if you compare a situation where you know position exactly right if this is psi and this is x a situation where you know position with a high degree of accuracy would look something like a dirac delta well right the probability of the particle being in this very narrow range is very high. We'll call it dx. Um, and as this thing, as this, as this, you know, delta function gets narrower and narrower and narrower uh, up to like the infinite limit where, you know, there's a 100% chance that the particle is at this exact spot. At that point, you know, the wave function just looks like a Dirac delta. And, you know, Dirac delta doesn't have a wavelength, right? Well, what's the wavelength of this thing? You can't measure it it's just it's it's a peak so because of that you know because of the fact that momentum is proportional to the wavelength well you don't know what the wavelength is the wavelength is garbage in, in this case you you can't find out what it is so because of that you don't know anything about momentum so that's sort of the physical interpretation of the uncertainty principle which is you know because of the fact that in quantum mechanics you look at everything in the system in terms of a wave function well for the wave function, you know, at least in position space, right? Uh, if you know the position of where your particle is, aka if the wave function is peaked very narrowly, you don't know anything about the, about the momentum because how are you going to find the wave function of a Dirac delta, right? I, I mean, how are you going to find the wavelength of a Dirac delta? Whereas in the opposite case, if you don't know anything about the, about the position because it's just like a sine wave or something, you know the wavelength perfectly of a sine wave. But you know, what's the position? It doesn't make sense to say what's the position of a particle with a wave function that's a sine wave. It can be literally anywhere. Um, and that's sort of the end of this section. So now we'll move on to the problems.